It's the 1830s in the Sawalik Hills of India. Two British scientists dig into the earth and unearth bones the size of table legs. One looks like a deer, another like cattle, and yet another like a rhino. Their conclusion, they had no idea what creature they were holding. This puzzle would become one of paleontology's most legendary debates, involving a giant herbivore so strange that it still shocks us today. That animal was Sivatherium, and its story starts with confusion, misinterpretations, and a name invoking a god. Imagine uncovering bones so massive that even experts couldn't decide if they belonged to a deer, an ox, or a rhinoceros. That was the reality in the 1830s when the Siwalik Hills at the edge of the Himalayas began yielding fossils unlike anything seen before. These hills, part of what is now northern India and Pakistan, were a treasure ground for naturalists working in the service of the British Empire. Two men in particular, Hugh Falconer and Proby Courtley, were at the center of it. As officers of the East India Company, their work straddled both geology and medicine but it was their fossil excavations that left the deepest mark. In trenches carved into the sediment, they drew out skull fragments so heavy that it took teams of workers to haul them away, not to mention the massive leg bones that hinted at an animal far larger than any known deer. The difficulty was that every single piece seemed to tell a different story. A skull with flat spreading crests looked bovine, yet the teeth were high crowned in a way that suggested grazing animals. The heavy limb bones were closer to those of rhinoceroses. At a time when comparative anatomy was still an emerging science, these conflicting signals sparked long arguments. One scientist claimed the animal might be an outsized antelope, while another insisted it looked closer to an extinct species of ox. Letters raced between India and European institutions with plaster casts and shipping crates carrying the debate across continents. In Oxford, fragments were carefully mounted while illustrations circulated among members of the Geological Society in London. Each drawing tried to reconcile the puzzle, but the more details were compared, the less sense the skeleton seemed to make. It was Falconer who proposed a name that acknowledged the creature's almost mythical aura, Sivatherium, literally Shiva's beast, after the Hindu god of destruction and transformation. The name reflected not only its size, but the thought that it belonged to a vanished age of giants. For decades though, even with a formal label, the true nature of Civitherium remained unstable in the scientific imagination. One year it was catalogued near cattle, another year near deer, then briefly tied to the odd-toed ungulates. Only with more complete skulls and careful comparisons to living giraffes did the balance shift. Scholars began noticing that the ossicones, those horn-like protrusions on the skull, had close matches with giraffids. The teeth too aligned better with them than with bovids or rhinos. Eventually, consensus formed that Sivatherium was not a hybrid monster patched together from traits of different families, but an extinct branch of the giraffe lineage itself. This recognition stretched the limits of how scientists pictured giraffids, showing that the family once included not just long-necked browsers, but enormous thick-set animals in Asia and Africa. The discovery did more than solve a puzzle. It opened the door to a deeper understanding of how ruminants evolved across two continents. Most giraffids alive today carry only two small skin-covered projections on their heads, but Civitherium broke that rule in a dramatic way. Its skull carried not two, but four ossicones arranged in pairs that gave the animal a profile completely unlike anything you would see in a zoo today. The rear pair were huge flat and spread outward like the base of a stag's antlers, while the front pair were shorter spike-like cones that rose just above the eyes. From a frontal view, the skull looks crowded with bone ridges flaring in multiple directions, as though the head itself were trying to branch outward. No other ruminant ever showed quite the same setup, which is why paleontologists have always paused here, asking what role such a costly ornament could have served. These structures weren't light. A modern giraffe's two ossicones are modest in comparison enough to be used for necking contests where males swing their heads into each other, and a capi's shorter bump still act as pushing points during dominance clashes. Now imagine doubling that number and enlarging half of them into broad plates. A skull reconstructed with all four ossicones intact weighs an incredible amount, adding strain that demanded support elsewhere in the skeleton. That is where Civitherium's short muscular neck comes into play. 
Unlike the slender elongated vertebrae of its giraffe relatives, these neck bones were compressed and reinforced with muscle attachment sites and engineering solution to balance the load of an oversized head. The entire body matched that same theme of bulk. Estimates suggest that Civitherium weighed between 1,200 and 1,800 kilograms heavier than any living giraffe and on par with a modern bison or even a small car. The shoulders carried much of the burden and the limbs were thick bearing more resemblance to a ground-bound giant than to a runner of open plains. Place it side by side with a giraffe today and the difference is striking. Where the modern species is tall, narrow and high browsing, Cyvotherium looked squat yet massive, its silhouette almost block-like. The ossicones only amplified this drawing attention immediately to the head. Scientists have long argued over whether these structures were meant as weapons ornaments for attracting mates or defensive hardware against predators. Evolution rarely maintains such a weighty feature unless it serves a purpose. And in this case, the most likely uses overlap. They could have been visual signals of maturity and strength. They could have been clashed together when males fought, and they certainly added an imposing presence when facing threats. Taken as a whole, the four horns define Civitherium as one of the most heavily ornamented ruminants known, and they remind us that the giraffe family experimented with far more shapes and body plans than the surviving species might suggest. A creature this large had to eat and survive in landscapes that never stopped shifting beneath its feet. During the Pleistocene, Africa and South Asia were mosaics of savannas, open woodland and gallery forests following twisting river systems. Imagine seasonal rains swelling floodplains into green swamps, followed by long dry months when only scattered acacias broke the horizon. Civitherium was not a specialist perched at one end of that spectrum. It had to adapt to all of it from rich grasslands to sparser woodlands or it would not have lasted as long as it did. When paleontologists studied the wear and microscopic scratches on its teeth, they ran into a puzzle. Some marks hinted at the abrasion caused by grass, others matched the softer patterns seen in leaf browsers. This combination was the giveaway. Civitherium was a mixed feeder shifting strategies depending on what each season provided. In wet stages, it probably lowered its broad mouth to graze much like cattle. In drier stretches, it could lift its head and strip foliage from, from trees or shrubs. That range made it unusually flexible when compared with animals that lock themselves into one type of diet. What makes this flexibility even more striking is how it placed Civitherium alongside an incredible lineup of other megafauna. Stegodont's close relatives of elephants loomed over the river valleys. Hippopotamuses wallowed in pools and early forms of horses grazed across the grass belt. In such company, holding onto a niche required either speed armor or strategies that cut across environments. Civitherium had none of the first two, but it did have that hybrid feeding style and that made a difference in whether it could expand from Africa into South Asia and beyond. Social life added another layer, those heavy ossicones, especially the rear pair, hint that males may have squared off against each other. Modern giraffes slam neck into neck during competition while antelopes spar with horns. With Civitherium, the hardware suggested contests that may have been brutal, the kind that determined which males gained access to groups of females. If herds did form, they offered real benefits. Banding together reduced the odds of being picked off by predators like hyenas, lions, or even hominins moving into these same environments. Collective vigilance and group defense were as essential as bulk. Adaptable feeding, large size, and probable herd structures made Civitherium an enduring figure across millions of years. It was not locked into one ecosystem, but moved across swamps, savannas, and woodlands that came and went with climate cycles. And yet, despite being built for flexibility, even this survival strategy was not enough in the long run. Resilience carried it across continents, but it did not guarantee a permanent place in the story of life. Early researchers once pictured Civitherium with a short trunk, almost like a miniature elephant. If you look at 19th century sketches, you'll see wide-bodied animals with drooping, tapir-like snouts. The artists who drew these reconstructions weren't being careless. They were working with fragments, incomplete skulls, and missing context. At the time, only portions of the jaw and some scattered cranial pieces were available. And without the full nasal structure, the most convenient explanation was that this strange beast had something flexible attached to its face. 
These images spread quickly in scientific journals and illustrated natural history books, planting the idea that Shiva's beast was half real animal and half mythical caricature. For decades, these imaginative versions defined how the public understood Civitherium. Visitors to museums saw models with trunk-like appendages and assumed the animal was a prehistoric cousin of elephants rather than a giraffid. Paleontology in the 19th century relied heavily on interpretive art, and when the evidence is incomplete, the boundary between speculation and fact blurred. There's a good chance these depictions slowed recognition of Civitherium's real identity. The mistake wasn't entirely unreasonable either. Other hoofed mammals, the Saiga antelope tapirs, even some extinct gomphotheras, show that flexible nasal structures have evolved multiple times. Without better fossils, it was easier to copy patterns already known in nature. As the fossil record improved, researchers revisited the idea. More complete skulls revealed solid bone where a trunk cavity should have been. Later, high-resolution cranial studies and CT scans mapped the internal passages of the skull, showing nasal openings consistent with giraffids, not elephant-like animals. In other words, the trunk hypothesis collapsed under the pressure of anatomy. Digital reconstructions created in recent decades have given a much cleaner image, a broad-headed short-necked giant with two massive rear ossicones and two front spikes above the eyes. The once mystical trunk transformed into a straightforward nose, leaving the horns as the main focal point. Cultural artifacts were drawn into the debate as well. A small bronze object known as the Kish rain ring from ancient Mesopotamia depicts a horned animal unlike modern species. Some claimed it might represent Cyvetherium, a rare case of humans encountering it before extinction. Others argued it was more likely a stylized deer or ibex created through artistic exaggeration. These debates matter because they show how human imagination attaches to incomplete evidence, whether fossils or ancient art. It reflects the tendency to connect what we think we see with what we hope to find. Today, the difference is striking. Where 19th century art pictured a bulky creature with a proboscis modern reconstructions show a heavily built giraffid with multiple ossicones and no trunk. Correcting the old myth doesn't erase those mistakes, but it does highlight how science refines itself, shifting from error to accuracy as new evidence comes to light. For all its size and weaponry, Civitherium still disappeared forever. The fossil record shows that its extinction happened during a time of dramatic ecological turnover, when many of the world's largest mammals were vanishing. This was the late Neogene and early Pleistocene, a stretch of prehistory marked by climate instability and reshaped habitats. Giants that had flourished for millions of years from stegodonts to oversized hippos began slipping away. Civitherium was one of them and its disappearance fits into this broader pattern of megafaunal decline. The question that lingers is why? On paper it seemed resilient. As a mixed feeder it had the ability to browse leaves and graze grass, switching diets as seasons demanded. That flexibility should have given it an advantage, yet the landscape itself kept changing under its feet. Shifting rainfall patterns, altered plant communities, savannas, replaced woodlands, and the types of vegetation Civitherium relied on began to shrink. What had once been a patchwork of woods and grasslands turned into more open, drought-prone savannas. For an animal that carried nearly two tons of weight, even minor changes in food supply could create enormous stress. Size once a strength became a liability. Large-bodied herbivores require vast amounts of food and they have less ability to adapt quickly to sudden shortages. Smaller relatives, more flexible in their foraging ranges and needs, often survived where giants failed. In the case of Civitherium, being massive meant depending on stable and abundant resources. When those slipped away due to climate fluctuations, no feeding strategy could completely buffer the pressure. There is another layer of uncertainty timing. Fossils of Civitherium range from about 2.7 million years ago to as late as 780,000 years ago. But some studies argue that it may not have survived beyond 1.8 million years ago. The variation isn't just academic. It makes it harder to link extinction to specific climatic events. Fossil beds in the Sawalik Hills, for example, are often temporally mixed meaning bones from different eras lie together. Without precise layers to pinpoint last appearances, scientists are left with a window rather than a sharp date. 
Some have suggested that human activity may have added to the stress. The idea is that early hunting could have compounded ecological pressures targeting individuals in already vulnerable populations. Yet the evidence is thin. Human arrival in these regions is difficult to line up exactly with Civitherium's decline. So hunting remains a debated possibility rather than a proven cause. Whatever the immediate trigger, the lesson is clear. Even heavily armed giants with horns and bulk that made them seem unassailable were still vulnerable to environmental change. Civitherium shows that mass does not equal security. Its loss is part of a broader story of turnover where species too large to adapt quickly were swept away. Its legacy today is not in survival, but as a reminder of how fragile ecological balance can be, even for the strongest of creatures. Civitherium was evolution's forgotten experiment combining immense size with four imposing horns, and yet it vanished when environments shifted beyond its limits. Its story shows that even giants built for strength and adaptability could not outlast changing climates. That lesson feels uncomfortably close today when modern ecosystems face similar pressures from rapid environmental change. If a creature as formidable as Civitherium could disappear, the species we depend on now are no less vulnerable. Its extinction is not an isolated curiosity, but part of a much broader story, one that continues to unfold in the living world around us.